Hi there once again and welcome to another Expresso Mechanic tutorial. And this is the first in a two part series in which we're going to be building a safe combination locking mechanism. Now in the first tutorial we're going to be working on producing the dial here and the associated discs which we need to align in a certain way in order to allow this locking bar to actually function. In the second tutorial we will focus on building the locking bar and getting this working in the appropriate way. That's what we're going to be about in this tutorial. So without further ado, let's see if we can make this happen. We'll start by bringing in a cone and our top radius will make 2.5. A bottom radius 5, let's make that 2.5, I'll put 2.3, 2.5, and our height 3.5. If we hit O to focus on the object so that we can see what we're doing, we can see that it doesn't need as many heights, so it only needs 2. In fact, 1 would probably be okay, and we'll give it 60 rotation segments. The orientation we can set to plus Z. Okay, so we've got that there. That's looking okay. So we've got the first part of our dial complete. The next thing to do is make this editable and select polygon mode and UL because we want all of these polygons. And then what we need to do is actually extend. In fact, what I need to do, let's have a look. Let's just go back to 3D view. We need to just say D for extrude and we'll go 0.5. That's as much as we need to do. We don't need to go mad with this. UL to select this outer edge here and then D for extrude once again and this time we'll go, let's, let's try going one. We can probably go a bit further than that. Let's go two. Yeah, I mean two looks good. That looks that looks as if that's going to work. That's going to give us quite a nice looking dial, I think. So we've done the first part. We've actually got the dial created. The next thing I'm going to do is show you how to actually make a texture for this dial that will give us the appropriate divisions all the way around it. We'll get, we'll, we're going to be using 60 divisions and I'll show you how to do that next. That's going to be the next step. I'm going to switch to my edge mode and then select UB for ring selection. And now I can select all of these edges. I can then say edge to spline. So that's given us we'll call this dial, we might as well rename it. This is, it says cone spline, we'll just call it dial spline. Now, what I did in my original, I'm going to switch to a different file here. What I've done, I've taken this spline here, we can see that we've got dial spline here. We I've taken that and I've got it here. And I've made some adjustments here and there. So at the zero point and the tenth the 20th, the 30th, 40th and 50th spline divisions, for want of a better word. <laughs> what I've done is selected the points at the end of them and then I've just used the scale tool here to just push them out. And that, that's made room for what you can see here. So we've got numbers in there. Now the numbers, what I've done, I've created a cloner I've set it to radial, a count of six, and my radius here, I've got 5.6599. You may need something slightly different. That's placed these numbers in the correct positions. Now, let's take a look at what we've got going on in the text splines. I've put the numbers in them appropriately, so 0 to 60, and their heights, I've put down here that they're 1.65 or 0656, so they're quite fine tolerances. Those are in there. Drop these into extrudes, and I haven't put any offset there. 
because I want them flat. So I didn't do anything clever there. Obviously, no, nothing with the caps or anything like that. Just just put start end caps on them. Nothing in terms of the sizes or anything like that. Not bothered with that. So I've got those numbers in and they're placed as they need to be. There's nothing in the transform here. There's nothing going on there. So they're just set up as they need to be around the edge of the dial. And then all I did, I brought a flat plane in automatic for the display color and I just set the color to white and then when I rendered this out and I what I did in my view here I said users render view and I've set this up in my front view just users render view there and when I render out we get the dial now how did I get the actual divisions done well that's quite easy I just created a hair material color the first knot I set to black and the second knot, well, that wasn't required. So as you can see, I simply removed it and just left the first one in there. And then the thickness I made 0.1 to and it's root to tip 0.1. So they're both the same. And that's all I did. And then I just simply set it up, rendered it out as a 2K texture um, and then did it from there. I mean, if you check the output here, I've set that up with a preset or I didn't really use a preset. I just I just set it up as 2048 by 2048. So that it was a 2K texture. And and that was as much as I really did there to create that texture. And then it was simply a case of saving it as a TIFF file and then pulling it back into this particular file and then placing it on the dial. So that's what we're going to do in our situation here in our scene here. So if we create a new material, go into it, we can say texture load image. And in my thumbnails, this is just where I happen to save it. Down here, I have got dial tiff and I can bring that in. I won't put it in the search path. So it's now in and I can drop this onto my dial and we can see that it's not orientated correctly so we need to take away the UV mapping and make it flat and then we can start playing around with it now the UV length we need to make these 140 140 let's just have a quick look we also need to make it fit the object let's just fit to object so now we can see that we've got it somewhere near it and our lengths have defaulted so we need to go back to 140 by 140 so we've got it there and then we've got to orientate it by moving it so we need to go into our tool here or our mode here our texture mode and we need to move this around until we get it in the correct place so let's see what we can do we just get a hold of this and move it it's actually orientated incorrectly at the moment it's backwards so we need to reverse it let me just check where I am in here so yeah so I'm in the minor said so what I'll do is actually if I just get a hold of my dial and I turn that through 180 degrees I can set that up appropriately so let's just 180 degrees set that up there now we can see that we've got that there we still need to orientate the texture correctly so let's do that if we just get a hold of this and reverse it hold down the shift till we get 180 degrees and let's see where we are from there we just move this over and there we go we're getting something that's somewhere near it we've got to do a little bit of scaling what i'll also do in the texture here we just open this in the viewport. I'm going to make this 2K. So we'll select that just to make it finer so that we can see what we're doing better. That looks nice. And then it's just a case of, I mean, yeah, it's pretty close as it is, isn't it, really? I mean, we could leave it there. But if you wish to, you can just do a little bit more scaling. So we can just go into our tag here. We could make this 142, maybe. 
just to make it that slightly bit bigger and this 142 and then move it accordingly so that we get it just a little bit closer to the edge you know you can play around with this to your heart's content it's it's not too difficult to do and then you know once you've got it somewhere near where it needs to be and it looks about even on on all sides you can just leave it and it's done so that's all you need to do we can go back to our model mode now uh, and, and leave it like that that's great looking really nice now the spline we don't really need anymore we can either delete it or you can just turn it off just you know just leave it in the scene and just switch it off in case you wish to go back to it and do some more work but you shouldn't really need to but there you go that's how you do the texture for the dial and that looks really nice that's ready to go then and we can move on from here before I move on to making the discs I'm just going to work with my dial here again so I'm in edge mode and I need to say UL and select this edge just scale that down it's just by eye it doesn't really matter how much you scale it down and then we can switch back to polygon mode ul d for extrude we're set to 10 and that's fine we can always adjust afterwards but we'll just do this just to give it like a spigot that the uh the, the actual discs can be placed onto fantastic so we've got the dial complete that far the next thing to do is bring in a cylinder so I'll bring one of those in orientated plus Z now our object the radius needs to be 10 the height 1 1 height segment and 60 rotation segments and we've got our first disc now we can move this until we place it where we want it which is probably going to be somewhere there that will be fine because we've got to put an outer ring around just well, just behind the dial that's something we've got to do as well so we'll do that a little bit later but we've got our first disc in there the thing to do now is to make it editable because we're going to be working with it and taking a chunk out of it we don't necessarily have to make it editable first but we'll do that anyway because laterally the whole thing has got to be editable next thing to do is switch to our front view so f4 and I'll switch off the dial completely just to get it out of the way for now and we can then switch to point mode and we can work with a spline tool so spline pen I will grab a hold of that and we'll just create a spline now I'll come down eight squares and this is the shape that we're going to create we just want this shape for our spline we'll select the top two points and move them slightly high oops that's not done what I wanted to let's just select that one and that one move that up that's what I want to do okay so we're moving our spline just above the level because we're going to be using this to actually cut a chunk out of our disc that's what we're ultimately going to be doing we just need to select this bottom point here and the tangents need to be soft and then we can use the scale tool just to bring that out to somewhere there just to give us a nice curve at the bottom okay fantastic so we've got that far if we switch back to our 3d view so f1 we can see that we've got our cutout there or our spline, our spline profile for our cutout we can then drop this holding down the option key into an extrude and our offset we can make one point about about 1.4 will do fine for that and let's have a look I've got a cylinder in the extrude I don't want that do I take that away must have had that selected at the same time as the spline that's okay not a problem we can just move this into position let's just turn that snapping off move this into position so somewhere around there that will be fine and drop this beneath the cylinder select them both so command select this the actual cylinder and then holding down the option key we can select in fact command and option because they both need to go into it we can select the bool and straight away we've got it set up a subtract b which is what we need it to be and we also need to check create single object because we need to make this editable and remove 
the resulting cylinder extrude and call it disk one. We can remove all of these selections as well. Okay, so we've got our first disk. The next thing we need to do is actually bring in a null object and drop it into the disk and then zero it out. In fact, it is zeroed out, which is interesting. So that must mean that our dial, where is our dial? Well, our dial dropped into the wrong thing. I need to drop it into our disk and then zero it out, dropped into the wrong thing. There we go. Let's go back into our null, select this, zero it out, and zero that out as well, actually. Okay, brilliant. So we've got that in there. Now, this object for the null, I'd like that to be a circle. Make it 0.5 so that it's quite small. And then what we're going to do is just bring it up until it's, well, if we switch to our front view, so F4, we can see it. So I'm just going to bring it up until it's just about touching the top edge there. Again, you can do this by eye and you don't have to put it right where I've put it. I'll also orientate it in the Z axis to make sure that it stays where it is so that we can always see it. So that's fine. And that's going to be U1 and it's U for unlock. So when we've got our three disks and they've all got these cutouts, when these things align with each other or just about align with each other, that's when the thing will be able to be unlocked. That's what they're going to be used for, but not in this tutorial. That's for the, the second part. OK, so we've got that done. The next thing that we can think about doing is copying this disk twice and then just renaming these disks to and three. And then we can think about positioning them. So let's just bring the dial back so that we can see where we are. We'll select our second disk and go back into model mode. And in our coordinates, let's just see where we are. So disk one, six point, I'm going to make that six, just a round number. I'll make this one eight and the final disk 10. And that set those up fine. They're in their initial positions and we can see that the Spigot is a bit too long. We could we could alter that, but I don't think it's worth bothering with personally. We might as well just leave that where it is. But anyway, that's our three disks set up thus far. The next thing that we need to do is add some more pieces so that we can use these disks to actually interact with each other. So that's going to be our next step. Before we start building the extra parts that we need, the thing to do is to actually orientate these in their start positions. So what we'll do, we'll start with our disk one. Now, I wish to orientate this minus 114 because it needs to move, or, or any, any uh, division that you need to use needs to be divisible by six degrees. So 100 minus 114, if we go to our front view, hit H, and we select garage shading. We can see that this is lining up with 41 on our dial. So that's fine. I'm, I'm happy with that because it's lining up appropriately. That's great. So we can leave that at minus 114. That's the starting position for our first disc. Our second disc, I'm going to orientate this at 30 degrees. 36 degrees I'm going to actually use as the unlocking position and I will set something up for that a little bit later. So this is just shy of where it would need to be to unlock but this disc is going to have to rotate in an anti-clockwise direction in order to get there. And this final disc here, our disc 3, we can orientate that I think we'll go minus 18. So it's somewhere near the top, but not quite there. So there are our start positions for our three disks. Now, the only thing we've got to do is set their axes back to zero. And this is a pain in the bum because if we switch to axis mode, the one thing Cinema 4D won't allow you to do is move just the axes. If I set this back to zero, 
it sets the whole disk back to zero, even though we're in axis mode. And there's nothing you can do about that. It just won't allow you to, to work in here to set these back to zero, unless somebody knows there's a way that you can do it. I mean, I've tried doing it holding the shift key, the, the command key, the option key, and various other um, you know combinations of keys. It doesn't make any difference. Um, if somebody does know a method for doing that, and it, I'm, you know, I'm not the Oracle, I don't know absolutely everything about Cinema 4D. It may be that there's some, there is a way of doing it that I've missed, but I don't know how to do it. So we're gonna have to do it manually, and I'm gonna switch to my front view so f4 and we'll start working in here hold down the shift key and we'll work it back now it was a minus 114 so we've got to go 114 degrees if we go 115 and then go back one degree so very carefully just go back minus one degree if we can get it there see this is the frustration it's it's you know you there's no easy way to be able to do it one degree that's what i want to go so that's now orientated correctly that's zeroed out got to do the same again with this one this was 30 degrees so we, we can go back to zero quite easily with that one that's 30 degrees that's fine that's taken us back and this was 18 so more difficult with this one so one go to 15 and then we've got to do it manually another three degrees so that we get to 18 but it's very very frustrating i wish that you know they'd sort that out and make it work because there we go 18 you know you should be able to do the adjustment in here i mean this is we can zero these out they're, they're just slightly off that one's okay that one's slightly off we can just zero that and it will still be okay then it will move, they will move fractionally but not enough to really worry us but yeah, that's a real frustration of mine. I really do wish when you're in this mode here that you could just use this and it would move the axes and leave the model alone. But it doesn't. But there you go. That's something that I hope Maxon will actually uh, sort out at some point in the near future. So, OK, great. So we've got those set up. We can just come out of our axis mode now. And they're ready to go. So we can think about making these other elements. The first thing we need to bring in is a cylinder. We'll orientate it plus Z, and it needs to be a tiny cylinder, so it needs to be 0.5 in the radius, in the height 0.5, one rotation segment, and we'll, we'll, we'll put 60 in the rotation segments as well, just to keep things consistent. We'll drop this into, let's have a look, yeah, drop it into disk one, and we can zero it out. So we can just zero that there and that's correct now all we've got to do is move it upwards so let me just move it somewhere here and we, we're not in the right place we've just got to move this into the correct position we probably want to go a little bit bigger in the height i think we can probably go one in the height actually let's just go one in the, the height there that should be fine and then we can position that appropriately let's just go into our top view so f2 go away i don't want to see you let's just switch on the snapping once again and just make sure that we get this in the correct place and that's fine yeah that's absolutely perfect that's great so this is we're going to call this c1 okay so that's c for collider not for cylinder because this is going to be a collider. And we need to create another one of these for our second disk. So we'll command drag to copy it into disk two. Once again, we will zero out the Z. The, the actual Y position is fine. It needs to be the same. So we can just drag this across, go into our top view once again, so F2, and we'll drag this until we get it in the correct place. And that's right where that needs to be so that's fine so we've got two colliders in there the next thing that we need to do is create a target and now our second disc needs a target we don't obviously need one for our first we just need the collider the second disc needs a target and the third disc needs just a target okay so that's the way this needs to be set up so let's bring in a cube and we can make this nice and small as, as we did with the cylinders in our z-axis we'll make it one 
we'll make this 0.5 or rather let's, let's make it one by one by one actually I think that might work okay and then we can drop this into disk 2 zero it out and once again we're going to move it it's not quite in the right place for the uh, the actual positions X that's that's another thing we've got to deal with what we'll deal with first though if we just switch to a top view once again just bring this into here and then we can think about bringing it over this way it's probably just bring it a little bit further actually just so that it's almost touching uh, cylinder there that should be fine and what we can also do if we wish to is just rotate it very slightly so that it's just lining up there nicely like that so that's okay that's in place so that will be we in fact it's not quite in the right place in for it needs to just come back this way it needs to be this side let's just go into as top view once again just move that until it just lines up nicely with that let's see where we are yeah that's looking good let's just check the front view go into lines just see where we are just zoom in a little bit closer so that we can see where we are it's, yeah, it's just through that there let's just take the snapping off and just move this over it wants to be sort of about there doesn't want to doesn't want to be quite touching the cylinder that should be okay we can just move it down a little bit as well somewhere there something like that I would think would be okay superb so that's all set up and ready to go the next thing to do then is create the final one for our disk 3 so if we just command copy to drag this in here and then we can move this across so that it's lining up there just going to view 2 or top view I should say once again so F2 just get that into the correct place that looks good and that looks as if that's going to be fine that's going to work okay so those are in place and they're ready to go now we can rename these so the cubes will be called T1 because they're targets and T2 so everything is now set up as it needs to be within our disks the last thing that we need to model for the moment will be the outer ring so again I'm going to bring in a cylinder orientate it plus Z make it eight this time in the radius one in the height one height segment and 60 rotation segments I can then move it back and place it just behind the dial so that just sits there that's fine and then all I need to do is create a polygon and this will be used as an indicator like a little arrow that just sits at the top of here so let's get a polygon get one of those from here we'll make it a triangle so that's what we need it to be so we'll check triangle orientate it plus Z it's way too big at the moment let's just make it much smaller let's make it I don't know 0.5 by 0.5 as a starting point and then we can bring it up into the correct position it's not far off the right size actually if we drop that into the cylinder we can just move it back zoom in a little bit closer so that we can see what we're doing move it up so you can see it's not actually too bad in terms of its size is it but what we'll do we'll just bring it up to here I'll make it editable go into point mode and select the bottom point and just drag it down so that I get something like that that's quite nice and then polygon mode select this polygon D for extrude and I'll go minus because we're working with an inner polygon as we can see here we're working with something that's purple as opposed to orange so we need to go minus we'll go minus 0.2 and that's fine that's given us what we want that's given us a little indicator there and what I'll do I'll just call this indicator this can be outer ring 
and we'll just control this or, or rather change its color automatic and we'll make it red that's great so we've got that all set up and ready to go looking nice fabulous yeah I mean that's that looks fine that looks really nice it's it's lining up okay with that um, the only thing we could do is possibly adjust this slightly the texture we could just move it over slightly but I'm not too worried about it as long as it's near enough near enough is good enough if you wish to do that yourselves have a play around and get it absolutely smack on the line that's fine but for what I'm doing here I'm not that worried about it okay so that's got the outer ring ready to go so that's everything modeled everything is complete now and we don't need to do any more modeling so the next step then is to start thinking about the espresso and taking control of all of these objects let's bring in a null rename it espresso and start work let's get a tag and we've got the espresso editor open and we can have a go right the first thing we need to bring in will be well in fact we need C1 and we also need T1 so we've got this here and this here C1 is attached to disk 1 T1 is attached to disk 2 so we're going to be working with moving our disk 2 via our, well it's, it's actually going to be via our dial but we'll start playing around with the disks first so we'll give these both object ports and we'll plumb them into one of our new best friends which is going to be the collision tag now I have done a tutorial in the past on the collision tag but I've never actually used it in a practical example so this is a first so we'll plumb this into here and when these are colliding we will get a number one at the output if we just put a result node in there place this here now at the moment they're not touching but if I was to rotate disk one a little bit let's just go into model mode if I rotate disk one we will see let's just get this back so that we can see it if I just do that we should get a one at the output now why are we not doing so well I've actually done this deliberately to show you if we just undo that and get it back to its start position we should make all of these editable because it works or the collision of the collision node only works with geometric objects so we'll select c1 t1 that should be c2 by the way just quickly rename that c1 t1 c2 and t2 hit c to make them editable and now you can see that we are getting a one in there because it is touching so that's working as it should so let's just make sure that we reorientate this correctly it is it is actually zeroed out so that's okay that's working it's doing what we need it to do they are just about touching so that's fine so that's our first part of our setup now we need to bring in disk one so that's our next port of call and obviously this is going to be rotating around its rotation B so we need to put rotation B at the output here so rotation B that gets our first output done now we need to we need to know actually which direction this is moving in so we're going to compare its current rotation B to its previous rotation B so we'll bring that in now how do we do this well we need to bring in its previous local matrix that's what we need to work with here and this is important stuff and we've not really done this in a tutorial before but uh, again this is a first it's a real world example where this is useful so we'll bring in the previous local matrix and in order to work with that we need a matrix to HBB so calculate matrix to HBB we'll bring that one in 
and we can plumb in this matrix into here. Now, the rotation order, we don't leave it at default. We're going to set it to X, Y, Z. That's the one we're going to be using on this occasion. OK, so we're, we're working with that. So we've got the first two pieces of this set up. Now, the next thing we need to do is bring in a compare. So we'll bring in a logic compare. And we're going to be comparing the B from the HBB with the rotation B from here. So that's how we're going to discover whether or not the current rotation B is, well, in this case, it's going to be greater than. So we're going to see if we're traveling in a clockwise direction on this occasion. And if we are, we'll get a one at the output. OK, but in order for this to work, we need two conditions to be satisfied. We need a collision and we also need to be moving in a clockwise direction if we're going to move this disk in a clockwise direction. OK, so that's what we're working on here. When we hit this cube and we're moving clockwise, we need this disk to follow suit and move clockwise as well. So that's that's what we're about at this stage. Now. We need both those conditions to be satisfied, so therefore we need a bool. And its function is set to AND, and that's fine because we need it to be AND. So we want both of these to be true for this output here to be true. So that's fine, that's all good. The next thing we need to do is decide what we're going to do with our anti clockwise direction. So again, we need another compare. So we'll bring one of those in. And on this occasion, we, we said greater than in our initial compare for our function. And this time we need to be less than. So if we're less than, then we're traveling in an anti-clockwise direction. So we can bring in our rotation B from our HBB. And we can bring it in once again from here to get that compare going. And then we need a second bool, so we'll command drag to copy this one. Once again, we want to know if there's been a collision and are we moving in an anti-clockwise direction? And if so, we would want to, we will have come to the other side of this cube here, the target, and we'll push the wheel in the opposite direction. That's what we're setting up. We now need a condition. So we'll bring one of those in. And we've got to decide what we're going to do. Well, we're going to switch between our two inputs here. So if this has been satisfied, we're going to switch to here. And when this has been satisfied, we're going to take our rotation B and we're going to pass our rotation B to this wheel. So when this hits, we're going to pass the, rot the current rotation B of this wheel to this wheel, and it will follow suit. That's what we're going to be doing there. But when it doesn't, what we need to do is leave this wheel in its current position. So wherever it happens to be, if we then rotated this wheel in the opposite direction, we want this to just stay where it was. We don't want it to move anymore. So we need to bring in disk two give it rotation B at the output port and then plumb that into here. So that set that little piece of it up. Now, it's OK to just give the current position of the wheel here straight to this disk here when we're traveling in a clockwise direction. But it isn't when we're traveling in, a, in an anti-clockwise direction, because we've got to take into account that we've got the thickness of the cube here. So we're, we're going to be beyond the zero point. So we've got to subtract some a, a few degrees, or in fact radians, from the actual rotation of this particular wheel in order to make this work correctly. So the next thing we need to bring in is a math node. And this will be a subtract in the function and we're going to plumb our rotation B 
into this input at the top and we're going to subtract and it's in radians and I happen to know that it's 0 0.2199 because I worked it out <laughs> so that's what we're going to be subtracting from there okay and then moving on from here we need another condition so we'll bring one in just a command drag to copy that one and this condition will be triggered by our second bool so this is when we're moving in our anti-clockwise direction and we will plumb the output or from our mass subtract into the input 2 here so when we are moving in an anti-clockwise direction we want to be using what's coming out of the subtract but at all other times we want to be using the output from our first condition so when we're not moving in an anti-clockwise direction we either want to be moving in a clockwise direction or we want the disk to be standing still we want it to be stationary that's what we're setting up there the final part of this little piece of the puzzle is to bring in disk 2 drop it here and give it a rotation B port at the input stage so we'll do that connect those two together and now we've set up our first part of this expression we're not complete yet because we're only dealing with disk 1 and disk 2 but that's the first part of this expression so if you've got a situation in the future where you want to use one wheel to move another and you've only got two wheels this is how you go about setting it up so let's just close this down and let's see what happens when we move disk 1 I'm just going to move it just yeah that, so it definitely is moving it anti-clockwise you've got to be very careful with this because it can be a bit finicky if you don't quite get it right you might have to do some adjustment with where we're placing things let's just see what happens now if we just move that round yeah we're picking it up and we can see that we are moving it so it's moving in a clockwise direction and if we move away from it it should leave it there it, it's a little bit finicky isn't it you can, you can see it's a little bit dodgy now why would that be well let's just go into our collision and let's just see how we've got it set up now at the moment it's in bounding box mode I don't want that I want it in object mode because object mode gives you a better collision now let's see what we get now and now that's much better that's working far better it's giving us the result that we really want and if we just move the wheel round we should see that that is working you've got to be a bit careful if you go too fast it will go through the object so you know you do have to be a little bit careful with it how you how you actually go about doing it but it, it does work it does the job pretty well and when you're animating this if you just you know if you set this up with animation it's going to be working fine but you can see that that's doing the job it's actually doing what we set it up to do so that's great okay fantastic so let's just zero out our wheels again just zero this one out and we'll zero out disk two so they're set up and they're both working fine now we want to work with our third disk as well so we obviously want that to be controlled by disk 2 now in order to do that we've got to do a little bit more work and we've got to extend this expression and that's what we're going to do next first thing to do is just maximize the window so make it really large and just move things over to the right we'll bring in an iteration and it just needs to work with two objects so it's iteration n will be one moving on from here we need four link lists so we'll bring one in set this up here and command drag to copy so that we end up with four link lists now our top link list here we're going to put our c1 and c2 in there so we'll just re we'll select the link list grab a hold of the eyedropper select c1 and c2 i'm going to just move things in the window so that we can see them easily our second link list we want t1 and t2 
So we've got C1 and C2, and we can now lose both of these from the expression because we're going to be using the outputs from our linked lists. So we'll plumb our iterations output into the first two of these and then plumb these in here. Now, our third linked list, we need disk two and disk three in there. So we'll select those, disk two and disk three. And finally, our fourth, we need disk one and disk two. So they are all set up appropriately and we can plumb the iteration into their index ports. Right. Now, the output from our link here, that needs to go here. So we need to give disk2 an object port at the input stage. We'll just move that out of the way. So we can then plumb our link into there. Just move that down so that we can see a little bit more. Now, what we need to do at this, the input stage here with disk1, we need to bring in an object port. Just make it slightly bigger once again. Let's move this down. And then we can plumb the output of our linked list here into the input, the object input of disk one. That's fantastic. So that's set up and ready to go. That's the first bit of our expression continued there. Now, we also need to give disk2 at the end here an object port. That's important. And we'll put it at the top. Just place it there. And then we can work with the output of our linked list here. That will need to be plumbed initially into here. So that's set things up so far. I think that's as much as I need to do for the moment. I'm just checking my notes just for the moment. I think we've got it to where it needs to be. What we'll do, we'll have a play and we'll see if anything's working. And if we've got any errors, we can easily fix them. So let's just shut this down. Let's just have a quick play. We'll move disk one and see if they all move. Yeah, you can see that disk three is now moving. That's fine. And if we move backwards, we can move around and we will move disk two and it leaves disk three exactly where it should be. Let's just go around one more turn and see if we can move disk three in the opposite direction. Let's just come around, see if we can touch and we can. So there you go. It's working. It's doing what it should do. So that's things set up so far. Now, at the moment, we can't reset things back to zero. We're, we're just sort of leaving it there. I mean, it, you know, that may or may not matter to you, but for, you know, for the start of an animation, it might be important. So what I suggest we do is set up some user data and find a way that we can actually make all of these things move back to their initial start positions. So for now, let's just do this manually. So I'll set that one back to zero. Disk two is zeroed and disk three will set that back to its zero point. OK, so they're all zeroed out and they're ready to go again. So that's great. If we just bring the expression back, just have a quick look at that, just to give you a quick idea of how it's working. So we can see that we're just sending out a couple of objects each to various points via the iteration here, and it's sequencing through them so that they're being checked one after the other in sequence. That's all we've really had to do in order to get things to that stage. Moving on from here then, we'll set up our user data to reset everything back to zero. Okay, now before we do the user data, what I'm gonna do next actually is add another expressor expression. Let's bring in another tag. And all we need to do is bring in our dial and our disk one because we want the dial to control disk one. So we'll say coordinates, transform rotation, rotation B, and we'll do the same. 
at the input stage of disk one. So that's fantastic. We've got those two set up and we'll plumb those in there. And now when we move the dial, we should find that disk one reacts accordingly. Well, it does move, but it's moving in the opposite direction. So what we've got to do then, easy enough to fix, we'll just use the, where are we? Let's get the dial. We'll just set that back to zero, just zero then out. And what we'll do, we'll, where we've got 180 for our rotation H, we'll rotate this through 180 by using our rotate tool and holding down shift. And just fix that, that's fine. That's, it's at 360, we'll make it zero. That's fine, that's perfectly good. So now we can, sh well we should get the result that we want. That's okay in there. So just take that off, rotate the dial, and now we do get the result that we want. The dial is controlling our disk one. And that's exactly what we needed to do. Fantastic. Now you could ask, why don't I just group disk one into the dial and then place the dial in the expression over here? I could put it in this link list, you would think, because just replace disk one with the dial. It doesn't actually work. I've tried it, it doesn't work. So we'll leave that. But if you, you know, if you want to have a play around and see what happens, please do. But uh, yeah, that's why I'm doing it this way. OK, let's go back and see where we can go from here. So we'll need another null. We'll call this one controller. And we'll work with our user data. So in our user data, we can add user data and we will add a group. Take it away from the user data default there name this control and then drop our data here into it name this reset it will be an integer and i wish to use radio buttons so zero semicolon and i will put three one semicolon reset and if we just check our example we can see what we're going to get exactly what we want. So we'll hit OK. We've now got the control tab and we've got a control here and we're all perfectly good. So that's what we like to see. Fantastic. So that's ready to go. Moving on from here, we need to do a bit more espresso. OK. The first thing we need to do is bring in another iteration. So we'll bring one of those in. The iteration n needs to be two on this occasion because we're going to be working with three objects instead of two. So we'll bring in a link list. Get that set up. We can plumb the iterations output into the index port and then we can populate the link list. We want the dial disk two and disk three. Moving on from here. We actually need a condition. So we'll bring one of those in. And the data type needs to be link. Because obviously we're going to be sending the output of our link list here through this. And it will be going through input number three. Now in order to control all of this, we need to use the controller. So we'll bring that in and in our control menu, we'll select reset. Now we'll give this an on port and we'll use the reset to switch on the iteration. We'll also use this to switch to using the output of our link list. Now these objects have got to be passed to the object input port of disk two. At the moment, they can't be because we've got something else plumbed in there, but the something else needs to be removed, plumbed in here, and then we can plumb the output in there. So that will allow us to pass the correct objects to disk two at the correct times. Great, so that's all set up and working, which is fabulous. Now, we also need to pass the correct values to 
what's going on in disk two. At the moment, that's working fine. But when we when we do our reset, we need to pass zero to these three objects. So we've got to set that up. So another condition. So command drag to copy this one. Once again, the reset will be used to switch this condition. And the input value at input three does need to be zero. And we need to pass the input value, or rather the, the value from our condition here, the output of our condition to the input in here. And then we can take this and plumb it in here. Right, let's see if this actually does anything. Now, at the moment, we're in a situation where we need to actually do a reset. So let's see if we do actually do anything. Well, it tries to, but we get a bit of a problem with the iteration. Let's have a look and see what we've got going on over here. Now, we can see that this iteration is also highlighted in yellow. And the reason for that is because we can't have two iterations going in the same expression at the same time. So what we've got to do is place a knot in here. And I've already in the in the edit I've given this an, an on port. So if we just connect this here and connect to this here, now we find that everything is working okay. So let's see what happens. If we've got the controller here, we'll hit the reset. Now we are we, we are reset. And if we go into free mode, let's see what happens when we move the dial. We'll just we'll just test this out and see what goes on. Right, so that's working. We're moving there and we can move back here. And then if we reset, let's see what happens. Well, we don't quite reset. We do, but we have to do it. We have to hit it twice to reset our first disk. Now the reason for that is because our dial and our disk are two separate objects. So this disk one here and the dial are two separate objects. And also because, of course, the dial is being controlled by our first expression when we're using this to control disk one. So that's where the problem is coming now. There are ways, one possible way around it is to swap these over, but it's not absolutely satisfactory because if we just switch back to free mode, select our dial, what you'll find is there's a slight lag. If you, you see, what I, see what I mean, if I let go, there's a slight lag and you're going to have that problem. There's not much you can do about that. So the only thing is, though, if we do do a reset now, everything does go back to zero. That's a bit of a problem. So rather than waste time now what i'm going to do is have a play around with this between now and part two and see if i can set something up and actually make this work so that we don't get this problem it may be possible to do it but i'm not absolutely sure at the moment but it will to be there must be a solution to it there's always a solution to problems doesn't matter what they are but we'll see we'll see what we can do but up until this point, everything is working as we want it to, which is great. That's not what I want to move. I want to move the dial. So, yeah, I mean, we've got it working this far and it, it is doing the do and it's it's all working. So that about completes the first tutorial and we've got everything working nicely. That's not what I want to do. Bring that one in. So yeah, that, that's our main expression. Just hit H so that we can see everything. So that's our main expression. And that's got everything working as it, as it needs to so far. It's, it's all doing the job that it needs to do, which is nice to see. So it is quite an involved one, I suppose. There's quite a lot of connections here and there, and it does look quite complex. But if you build it, you know, as with all expressions, you just build it one step at a time. It's really not as complex as it actually looks. It's just a case of passing objects in sequence through the linked lists to the correct places at the correct times and making sure that things synchronize up in, in the correct way in order to make them move in the correct directions at the correct times. That's all it is, really. And then this is just there to reset everything. You know, that's that's all it is. That's all it's really doing. But anyway, 
As I say, that's about the end of part one of this two part series. So in part two, what we'll be doing if we just close this down and switch back to my original file, we'll be building this locking arm and basically when the slots within our three discs all align perfectly, this will be able to rotate down into them and this indicator will move to pointed unlocked and we'll make that turn green and this will be turned grey. So we'll swap them round. That's the kind of thing we're going to be doing there. So be sure to tune in. It'll be quite fun. And uh, yeah, that just about brings us to the end of our first tutorial of this series. So as always, I really, really hope you've enjoyed doing this one and that you've got some good techniques that you can use in your own projects. And if you have enjoyed the video, then please give it a like. And if you haven't already, please subscribe to the channel and of course, leave a comment and ring the bell. And wherever you happen to be on social media, please, please do share this video because all this good stuff really does help keep the channel moving in the right direction. But anyway, that about brings us to the end of this tutorial. So I'll see you very soon in part two.